And that's how we, as you know, adults and you know, later on, you know, kids and everything else, will see God. How, how we react to our Father is how we react to God the Father. John Canfield you know, was, uh, uh, was teaching a, a class in seminary a few years ago, and he, he on the first day of the semester, you know, uh, handed out a, a personal questionnaire. Many of the questions on the survey had to do with the students' perceptions of his father and the relationship he had with him. The surveys were collected and no more was said of it. The students forgot about, all about them. During the rigorous months of study about the uh, first person of the Trinity, his attributes, his work, and his words. And at the end of the course, the, the professor handed out a second survey. This time, the students were supposed to honestly record their perceptions of God and feelings about their relationship with him. The questions, in fact, were the same as on the first survey that they took, but were redirected toward the Heavenly Father, not their earthly ones. When the professor returned uh, both sets of surveys, including the previous forgotten one, the students were astounded that even after a whole semester of studying about God, they still had trouble differentiating him uh, relationally from their earthly dads. God is not merely like a father. He is our father. He is our father. And, you know, don't, don't misunderstand me this morning. You know, just because, like I said, I'm talking about fathers this morning doesn't mean that God doesn't have a word for us this morning. I believe that there are truths which we can all glean, you know, from this sermon this morning. And then you may have never, you know, thought about this way before. But today, I want us to look together at our Heavenly Father, every dad's example. The first thing I want to look at, uh, you know, the first portion is that I want us to realize, the first thing I want to realize is that the father is not ashamed of the son. The father is not ashamed of the son. If we look at the beginning part of, uh, of, cha- uh, of verse 17 of, of Matthew chapter 3, what does it say? It says, my son, my son. That statement tells us that God is not, re- not ashamed of, uh, that God is not ashamed of the Lord Jesus. In fact, he is not ashamed of any of his children. That when we get saved, that he is not ashamed of, uh, of his children. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says this. It says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I mean, what an example, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, what an example that God the Father is to human parents, that children uh, need to know that we are proud of them and that we are not ashamed to claim them as our own. I've seen oftentimes where parents, you know, will sit there and they kind of joke around, you know, a child maybe, you know, wander off and somebody will bring them back and say, you know, does this one belong to you? And they're like, well, sadly, yes. You know, but, but the son, you know, but your children see that and they automatically you know, kind of maybe get that, you know, a little bit of insecurity in their mind if, if we do that, you know, well, sadly, it, no, it's like, no, yes, that one's mine. Just, yes, that is my child. That is my son. That is my daughter. Children need constant affirmation from their parents and will usually live up to your estimate of their worth. Therefore, you know, what we need to do is be very careful about how we treat our kids. Be, be quick to let them know that you are proud of them, just like the Heavenly Father. Just like the Heavenly Father. And so number one, we have that the Father is not ashamed of the Son. Number two is this, is that the Father adores the Son. I mean, notice, notice the part that, you know, that I left out. It says, beloved. He says, my beloved Son. He says, beloved. That means one who is dearly loved. Children, you know, obviously can live without many things. They can live without many things. But love is not one of them. Love is not one of them. I mean, perhaps the greatest gift a parent can give a child, besides the knowledge of the Lord, is the knowledge that they are loved unconditionally. Now, obviously, you know, we could sit there and say, you know, it's very easy to say that we love them that way, that we love our kids unconditionally, that we love them no matter what. But you know what? It's a lot harder to actually demonstrate it, to live out what we say. That's why, you know, people often, you know, there's that saying that says that, you know, talk is cheap, right? Words can be empty, but you got to show your child, you know, that you love them 
unconditionally. That one of the best ways for you to demonstrate godliness to your children is for you to love them unconditionally. We need to love them like God the Father loves us. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 3 says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, have I loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Romans chapter 8 verse 38 and through 39 says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor uh, things present, nor things uh, to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That all those things that can come at us, that no matter what, the Father still loves us, right? Jesus still loves us, right? That's how we should be, you know, with our kids, is that, yes, there's a lot of things that, you know, kids do that are not smart. There are a lot of things that we sit there and we scratch our head and go, why would you do that? Of course, you know what, God the Father probably does the same thing, goes, why would you do that? The same thing to us, right? And so, but the thing is, is that we need to have that same love that God shows us that nothing is going to be able to separate us from the love of Christ, and nothing is going to be able to separate us from the love of our kids. Amen? And, you know, genuine love is, is, is not afraid to express itself. Oftentimes, I've, you know, I've seen some parents kind of like worried about how to do that. Like, like how do I do it without seeing, you know, seeming to be mushy and gushy? You know what? Your kid doesn't care. Your kid wants, you know, your kid wants you, wants your love, and wants you to demonstrate that. Who cares what the other ones, you know, going around and be like, oh, that kid. I mean, We've had, you know, we've had him since Thursday. And he's already set us on his schedule. He told us, you know, like, no, we're not going to train you. I'm going to train you. He's like, you're going to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I'm going to go to bed at 7.30 at night. I mean, five days or, you know, four days it is. And, you know, he's already setting those things. But that's the thing is, is that, it's you know, genuine love, you know, doesn't express itself. And the thing is, is that for kids, no matter where they come from, kids need to know that they're loved. You can't sit there and wait for things to work out your own proper way or the way that you want to, you know, whatever. Kids want to know that you love them, right? Tell them that you love them and tell it to them often. They need to hear those three magic words, I love you. And it's not, oh, I forgot. Right? How often does God remind us of, of his love toward us? I mean, let us resolve to do the same for our kids. If God reminds us throughout his word about how much he loves his, you know, his children, how much he loves us, and all those things, then how much more should we show love towards our kids? Not, you know, and not just them, but in all of our family relationships, we should show love. Never be too stuffy or unemotional to respond to your children in a genuine display of love. Don't sit there and be like, oh, no, I can't do that. I was sitting there actually you know, thinking about it as I'm, as I'm over this morning. I'm like, I have a little drool marker here on my shoulder. I was wondering about that, about those things. But the thing is that you, you can't sit there and, and, and worry about those things. You can't, you can't worry about them. Janice Sue uh, Zeller uh, writes this. I remember uh, when I was five or six years old, having a big writing tablet on which I could do block printing. One day, I took a sheet of paper, folded it in half, and wrote, I love you, on the inside. I put my dad's name on the outside, covered, uh, covered the sheet with hearts, and set it on his dresser. I had made a, a valentine for him, and it wasn't even Valentine's Day. Eagerly anticipating what I thought would be an enthusiastic response, it never came. The next that afternoon, I discovered the valentine was in the wastebasket. This had to be, a, I, I thought that this had to be a mistake. I must not, he must not have seen it. I lifted the valentine from the trash and carefully stood it up in the center of his dresser. My heart was pounding. The next day, when I checked the, waste, uh, when I checked the wastebasket, it was there again. Only this time, it was crumpled with some other, uh, with some other papers. He must not have liked it, I thought. Or maybe he didn't see it. I smoothed out the creases as best as I could and placed 
the valentine on his dresser once more. I made sure that it was very conspicu- uh, conspicuous so that, or, uh, yeah, conspicuous that uh, this time that he would see it. The next day, Dad called me to him. I remembered feeling very shy. He said, Will you quit putting that note on my dresser? He demanded. I already know that you, uh, I already know that you love me. When I became a Christian, I thought about finding that Valentine in the trash and about how hurt and angry I felt. Why hadn't my dad reached out in love to me? Then I thought about Jesus. Jesus had put a Valentine on my dresser. It had my name on the outside, and on the inside it said, I love you. The lettering was not in pencil, but it was written in blood. It cost Jesus his life to send me his Valentine. I'm glad that he didn't crumple it and throw it away. So number one is this, the father is not ashamed of the son. The father adores the son. Number three, the father accepts the son. And the next, the next part, is, you know, the father says that he is well pleased. He says, this is, my, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. These words mean to approve of. God the father looked at the, the man Jesus Christ at, and had, uh, had become and said, I approve of you, my son. Now, when all, now we all know that, you know that our children may not turn exactly like we expect them to, right? Our, we may have some sort of plan. I mean, just you know, go over to the baseball fields and the softball fields, and you'll see all the, you know, all the dads and the you know, parents out there screaming and yelling at that dumb umpire because the umpire can't make the right call, right? Because their kid is going to be a pro when they're five, six, seven, eight years old, right? That they're going into the major leagues... I mean, think. I mean, I, I share this story, and it's out of disgust. There was a game that we uh, that we played this last year, and this there was a man that literally chased the umpire into the concession stand because he didn't like the call. I mean, seriously, it's a game. Get over it. Your kid's not getting a scholarship today. He's not signing, you know, a multi-million dollar contract. And even if he does, stop your whining. You know why? The umpire is human. They make mistakes. Get over it, right? And the thing is that oftentimes what ends up happening in that situation is that the kid sees how the grandpa, sees how the father, sees how you know, parents react, and they go, it must be okay for me. And then later on when that happens, when the kid starts treating other people like that, the parents will be like, where did they learn that from? You, Right? We're the kid's example, and the thing is, is that you have, a, you, know, you have people out there that, you know, thinking that their kids can never do wrong, right? Even though your kid you know, does wrong, you still accept them, right? You still accept them. And even you, if it is, call it like it is. You know what? You, you know, say sometimes you know, an umpire can make a mistake. Maybe he saw something different. Just go with that, right? But, you know, sometimes, you know, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe, you know, maybe we, we sometimes live in this, like, fantasy world where it becomes, you know, when it comes to our kids. Our kids, you know, may make mistakes and they may get into trouble and they may, uh, and they may not be as successful as, they, as we think that they can be. They may not dress, they may not dress right or, or look like you think that they should or any, any, uh, you know, any 10 million other you know, things that we could uh, you know, think that is wrong with them in their own life. But let's look at it this way. If your kid is seeking to please the Lord, Jesus, uh, the Lord Jesus as they are, then we need to accept them as they are and love them unconditionally. Right? That if, that if they're not living out our plan, we need to love them unconditionally. You know why? Because your plan is not God's plan. Right? Your plan is not God's plan. You say, you know what, I, I think that, you know, that, my, that they ought to be a carpenter or they ought to be a nurse or they ought, ought to do all these other things. And they say, no, I don't want to do that. I, I, I want to go you know, be a baker. I want to go do this. or I wanna, Whatever it is, whatever God's plan is for them, that, that's what we need to accept. We should never hold up our kids past before their eyes. 
and give them unrealistic expectations of them. You can't expect your kid, you know, I never send my daughter out there, I never say, hey, Lily, go change the oil on my truck. Why? Because she can't do it. She doesn't know how to do it. But there are things that, you know, uh, that we do give to her, and we say, you know what, go do this. Why? Because we know she can do them. Don't have, only, don't have like, unrealistic expectations about what your kid, you know, you know should and shouldn't do. That we are, you know, we, we, we are to love them and to accept them as they are. But here's the thing is, in contrast to God, we are often half-hearted in our acceptance of people by either directly or indirectly reminding them of their past. A person can get saved, like we had, you know, all three you know, people the past couple of weeks get saved out of Taven. And I can guarantee that somebody is coming along and telling them, well, God didn't really forgive you. You didn't really get saved. Don't you remember that you went out and you just did this, this, and this? God still sees it. No. And you're going to have all those people doing that. Let us be a church that doesn't do that. When a person gets saved, don't bring up their past. Bring up their future of where they're going. Same thing with our kids. If our kids mess up and they've gotten punished for it, don't keep bringing it up like three, four, five years later. Do you remember when you were five years old? No. The kid probably doesn't remember when they're five years old. Don't bring it up. And the thing is, is that when we do that, when we remind them of the things in their past after, they've been, after we say that we have forgiven them for it, it makes them feel like they don't quite belong that they're doing something wrong constantly, that they can never live up to our, exp- uh, uh, our expectations. For example, there was a minister who was visiting a, a rich man who had adopted a 12-year-old boy he had taken in you know, from off the streets. While the two men were talking, the boy, who was now 15, came into the room. After a casual greeting, the father went to, uh, to the closet, pulled out a, a pair of tattered old shoes, and said, Fred was, uh, Fred was wearing these when I found him, the minister saw the teenager was embarrassed and deeply hurt. But the father went on and said, I think it is, uh, it's good for him to, uh, to be reminded every once in a while of the condition when I took him in. Silently, the pastor prayed, said, thank you, Lord, for accepting me fully. Thank you for not dragging out my old shoes. We need you know, to remember that what we've done in the past is in the past that God has forgiven us of those things. You know, there's a word here you know, uh, for children, that if you are going to live like the devil, please do not expect your parents to place their seal of approval upon your life. Kids, if you're going to go out and you're going to live like the devil, you're going to do everything that you want to do, you're going to you know, go out there, don't expect your parents to give their a seal of approval. Don't you know, expect them to all of a sudden be like, oh, it's okay. You know what? It's unfair to expect that, and a godly parent can't, cannot, cannot give it or shouldn't free, uh, you know, give it if you've been living like the devil. There will be love, but sometimes it's called tough love. You can't always be accepting of every single thing. That's what I see nowadays. Whatever they want to do, I'll just be happy with whatever they want to. If they want to go out and they want to become a part, you know, part of the alphabet squad and the LGBTQ and all this, I'll still love them the same. No, tell them what the Bible says. Well, I want them to go out. It's okay if they go out and drink and they do drugs. I still, yes, you still love them, but you need to show them tough love. You don't have to approve of every little thing that they do. In fact, the thing is, is that what you, like I said, what you need to do is show them that, you know what, God you know, uh, gives us choices, but the thing is, is that we need to live the way that God wants us to live, the way that God's word says that, you know, that we are to live, not the way that we just feel like and go, well, I just love them no matter what. And parents, you do, uh, uh, and here's the thing is, that you do your children no favors when you offer blanket approval to their sinful ways. Perhaps your disapproval is just the, the wake-up call that they need. You can't just sit there and say, I approve of everything they do. They're just wonderful people. We have a whole generation out there that have had parents that have done that, and you see how well it's working, don't you? The, the kids have never, never done anything wrong. That They're just like, I approve of everything that they do. I just love them the same. And you know what? That's the reason why our prisons are full. It's to the point to the, where the prisons are so full 
that small minor crimes don't get put in jail. Or small you know, minor crimes go un, you know, unnoticed. Why? Because they're so worried about the bigger ones. My thought is that if you take, care of, uh, you take care of it when they are small crimes, when they are doing those things that are small crimes, they won't get to be big crimes. And then hopefully, you, but you know what? We've had an entire generation where the kid never did anything wrong, and somehow, you know, it was the teacher's fault. Or, you know what? It was everybody else's fault but the kid's fault. It was the boss's fault. It was so-and-so's fault. It was the principal's fault. It was this. It was this. No, sometimes you need to call it a, you know, a spade a spade and say, you know what? What you're doing is flat-out wrong. Okay? Make sense? So number one, the father is not ashamed of the son. Number two, the father adores the son. The father accepts the son. And number four, the father apprentices the son. Flip over to uh, John chapter uh, seven, uh, John chapter 5, verse 17. John chapter 5, verse 17. John chapter 5, starting at verse 17, I'm going to read to uh, verse 20. But Jesus say, uh, uh, answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but also said also that, uh, that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and, and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the son cannot do, uh, can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do, for what things soever he doeth, these uh, also doeth the father likewise. Verse 20, For the, fa- uh, the father loveth the son, and showeth him all things that, him, uh, that himself doeth. And he will, uh, he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Jesus is telling those that are listening that since the Father loves him, the Father includes the Son in his work and allows him to be a part of his life. That, when you, that what your Father does, oftentimes you will do. That us as, as children, us, you know, uh, you know that, that follow our, our Father, we're going to sit there and, and, and do those things. That Jesus is merely saying that, that the Father is working, that he loves the Son and shows him what he is doing. We can't sit there and just keep on expecting our kids to, to know just what to do. The thing is that we must actually show them what to do. When, he, uh, when, when the Father shows the Son his work, that... Uh, that is the Father's invitation for the Son to join him in his activity. And so those things as well, oftentimes, kids are oftentimes pushed aside, you know, off to the side and say, you know what, they don't really want to learn this. They don't really want to learn this. I remember this actually, you know, growing up, is that there was a lot of things that, you know, that my dad is, you know, very, very handy with. My dad, he, you know, he's, he's a mechanic by, you know, you know, by trade. He knows how to, you know, uh, to fix diesel buses. He, the same, you know, he could take, you know, a small motor as far as a, a lawnmower, big up to diesels, all that kind of stuff, and he could sit there, you know, put it back and forth, plus the fact that he learned, you know, how to do carpentry and all this other stuff, how to put, you know, a, a roof on, all these things. And I remember having this conversation, you know, one time was that I wanted to know he was working on my car and I was wanting to know what he was doing. And now I remind you, know, I remind you of this, my father is saved now. He, he, he thinks a lot differently than he once did. But I came up and said, hey, Dad, can you show me? Get away from me. I'm working on your car. All I wanted, you know, all, you, all I wanted to do was see what he was doing so I can learn and be able to do those things. Don't shy away your, your kids away from, you know, those things, you know, that, that you know how to do. Why? Because we're getting to a generation that doesn't know how to fix anything, for one thing. But also, kids want to know, they want to know what dad knows, so you can pass it on from generation to generation. So it's not a lost art to where you have to go to a, a dealership in order to figure out how to do something, or you got to get a professional contractor to figure out how to do it, that you can actually do it yourself, right? And that's what... That's what we need you know, to know. And like I say, I, I say all that to say, my dad's a different person now. Now he'll come up and say, um, yeah, go ahead and unscrew that bolt. Go over here and whatever. You know, he uses the, you know, the excuse of saying you know, that, 
you know, it's because he's getting older, he's not able to, you know, the, whatever. I think he's trying to make me feel good and say, you know, I can't, I can't quite turn that bolt anymore, you know. I think he's just using that as an excuse to be like, yeah, you know what, yeah, you, you go ahead and do it because you're so much stronger. Sure. It's just like this, you know, this, this story that I found with that one man, you know, this one man, he, he, he was telling a story about how he was frantically trying to push the lawnmower around the yard because it was getting, you know, he wanted to get finished before supper and before it got dark. And his six-year-old son came up and, without even asking, grabbed the motor handle handle because he wanted to help. So the dad quit, uh, quit pushing, and the mower soon uh, you know, came to a stop. Laughing to himself at the boy's futile attempt to push it by himself, the dad wanted to say, Hey, kid, get out of my way. But he didn't. Instead, he offered, he said, here, here, son, I'll help you. Together, they started pushing. The dad had to, to bend over and walk, you know, spread-legged to keep you know, from bumping into, uh, into his son. The grass got cut, but a, a whole lot less efficiently than before because the boy was, quote-unquote, helping. Suddenly, it dawned on the dad that this is the way my heavenly, uh, that my heavenly father allows me to help him build his kingdom. He thought to himself, I pictured my heavenly father at work seeking, saving, and transforming the lost, and there I was with my weak hands helping. God could do the work himself a lot more efficiently, but he, uh, but he allows us to work with him. I mean, what, to think about that, what an amazing privilege that is to be able to minister alongside the heavenly father, right? The godly father takes time to include his kids in his life. He models appropriate behavior, appropriate behavior before them, and more often than not, they will follow his example. And I thought about this before. I thought this, about this to my, you know, many a times. Is that usually the behavior that you see in your kids that you don't like? It was learned from somebody. And oftentimes, I sit there and I wonder, the times you know, where a kid acts up or acts out or something else, is that because of the fact that they have been taught that? And did I teach them? I mean, our, you know, think about it. Our time, I know that oftentimes dads will go out to work and they will you know, work hard and they will labor and they will do all these things. But our time with our kids is essential as well. I know that you can come home, be exhausted, be you know, all tired. But you know what? Maybe just the fact of you spending you know, a half hour, hour after you get done before you pass out and go to sleep. Go spend with your kids. Don't worry, about, you know, don't worry about the St. Louis Cardinals game. For one thing, they're not having a great year anyways. Don't worry about you know, the NASCAR race. Don't worry about all, any of those things. You know what? Maybe you turn the TV off and spend time with your kids. Because that's essentially what the kids want. The kids could care less what's happening to the, you know, the Springfield Card or the St. Louis Cardinals. I almost call them the Springfield Cardinals. There is a team, but you guys don't really care about the Springfield Cardinals and what they're doing. That's like a triple-A team over in Springfield. But think about you know, the, the time you know, that we spend with our kids is essential because the, the, lack, of, the lack of time that we spend with them Shows. I'm going to show you, you know, this story. There's a young man who was to be sentenced you know, to the penitentiary for uh, committing forgery. The judge had, had known him from childhood, for he was well acquainted w- uh, with his father, a famous legal scholar, and the author of an exhaustive study called The Law of Trusts. The judge asked him, Do you remember your father? I remember him. Well, your honor, came the reply. Then trying to probe the offender's conscience, you know, the judge uh, said, as you, are, as you are about to be sentenced, and as you, and as you think of uh, your wonderful dad, what do you remember most clearly about him? There was a pause. Then the judge received an answer he had not expected. I remember, sir. When I went to him for advice, he looked at, uh, at me, from the book, he was writing and said, run along, boy, I'm busy. 
When I went to him for companionship, he, he turned me away saying, run along, son, this book must be finished. Your Honor, I re you remember him as a great lawyer. I remember him as a lost friend. The judge muttered to himself, alas, finished the book but lost the boy. Don't worry about those things. You know what? When your time is to be off the clock, your time is to be off the clock, and let it be. Let it you know, be off to the side. Time with your children is never wasted. That's, that's never wasted time. But if we sit there and we put our kids off over and over again, that is wasted time. And we will oftentimes, we'll see the ramifications of us putting something else that we consider to be more, you know, more important than our kids or our spouse. Charles Adams, the son of, of President John Adams, wrote in his diary one day, when fishing, uh, when fishing uh, with my son today, a day wasted. The boy, however, had a different pr uh, perspective on the day. The entry in his diary for that day reads, When fishing with my father, the most wonderful day of my life. You may look at the time that you're spending with your kids that it, that it means nothing to them, but you have no idea you know, what it means to your kids. I do cherish those times you know, with my father that, that, that he took me along, you know, alongside of him, that, you know what, that he changed later on. Why? Because the Lord had changed him. I appreciate the times that I have with him you know, now and, and, the, and the times you know, prior to. Why? Because he, he, he realized, you know what, I messed up. And he didn't leave it there. He didn't say, you know what, I messed up. I might as well just, you know, keep on being, you know, living messed up and everything. No, he changed it. He said, you know what, I hadn't been there for my son, but I'm going to be there for him now. My two boys need me. Whereas he could be, you know, uh, doing a million other things, he will take time out of his day and say, you know what, how can I help my kids? So don't think, that, you know, just because, you know, uh, you know, fathers that you've messed up in the past or, you know, that, that there's no way, that, you know, that you could ever make it up. You know what? Change the here and now. Don't sit there and, and say, you know what, I messed it up. They're too far gone. They're out of the house. I live seven and a half hours away from my dad, and he still tries to, to help me with everything possibly that he can do. Alicia knows this. Her dad lives four and a half hours away, and will you know? Alicia's like, "Hey, can you do?" He will do it. Just because you may not have your, you weren't the best example of your kids growing up, does not mean that you can't change that now. You can't go back and change the past. You can't. Believe you me, there's a lot of things in my past I would like to change, but I can't. Why? Because I don't have a DeLorean. Okay, if you guys don't understand that, you know, uh, go watch, you know, Back to the Future. You might be able to understand the, uh, you know, the reference. I can use yours, Doc. Sweet. I didn't know you had one. Kids will have a different perspective of how you spend time with them. If you're constantly, like, on your phone all the time and your phone is more important and you're always constantly checking things out and your kid's like, hey, let's go play, hey, let's go do this, hey, let's what, and you're like, no, no, in a minute, in a minute, in a minute, and you keep on telling them, in a minute. You know what? The people on your phone can wait. Set it down and go take time with your kid. Your kids will appreciate it later on because the thing is, you know what? There needs to be a time where, you know, you turn off everything and you say, you know what, the world can do whatever they want to do. My friends, you know what, they may need an answer. I'll get it to them tomorrow. But you have to, you know, shut off. Why? For one thing, if you constantly are allowing your phone and other people to dictate your life, that's how you get burned out. You know that? Because if you don't ever turn off your mind or, your, you know, in your head, you don't have that set time where you say, you know what, I am not going to answer anything from anyone else because you know what it's time with my family that's why sometimes if you call me please leave a message because if you don't leave a message I consider it not to be important and I'm spending time with my kids that's what we all need to realize that's what we all need to do is realize that you know what there must be a time where we say you know what 
it's time for, you know, for me to spend time with them. Everybody else has got, you know, gotten me today, you know what, but they're more important. You know why? Because your kids are your biggest ministry. And your spouse, your wife, men, is your biggest ministry. You can be a, success, a, a, a huge success at work. You can be the CEO of a company, have all kinds of money. But if you lose your family, you've lost everything. And you know what? It's as simple as this. If you want your child to blank, then you blank. So if you want your child to grow up to be you know, a man or woman of God, then you must do what? You must be a man or woman of God, right? If you want your child to study the Bible, then you study the Bible. If you want your child to be hardworking, then you be hardworking. Include them in that hard work. Include them in that time that you're, you're studying you know, the Scripture you know, in the Word of God. Include them in those. If you want your, child, if you want your tri- child to be a criminal, then act like a criminal. It goes both ways. If you, if, you want your, you know, if you want your children to resent you, resent them. It goes both, like I said, it goes both ways. If you want your child you know, to be a good human being, be a good human being, right? The greatest truth or lifestyle that we can show them is to point, is to point our kids, is to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Dads, have you made sure that your children are saved? Have you made sure that kids, that's the biggest thing that you can, you can find out about your kids is whether or not they're saved or not. You say, how do I do that? Well, you know what? Have they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do they put, have they put their full faith and trust in him you know, to save them? If they say, well, no, I don't really know, and you haven't you've been around them to even ask, that's you know, number one right there. That's number one. And here's the other question. Are they sure that you're saved? Do you act in a way you know, uh, that they know that you are saved? And obviously, you know what, as, you go, as I read these things, you're going to say, well, Pastor, it sounds, sounds, some of the stuff you said it sounds a little bit harsh. The thing is, is that I, I don't think for a minute that obviously that us as earthly fathers could ever reach the level of our Heavenly Father, especially the one that our Heavenly Father exhibits towards the Son, towards the Son. However, I do think that all of us in this room, you know, could sit there and say, you know what, I need to do a better job of, of modeling the Father. That we all need to do a better job, right? For instance, did you know that a recent survey of five-year-olds found that they would rather give up their father than their, than their TV? And did you know that more text messages are sent on Father's Day than on any other day rather than calling them by phone. I have one last story to share with you. There was a nun who worked at a men's prison who was asked by one of the inmates if she would buy, buy him a Mother's Day card to send to his mom. She agreed, and, and word traveled fast. Soon, hundreds of inmates were asking for cards. Resourcefully, the nun contacted the greeting card manufacturer who, who, obliged, uh, who obliged her with crates of Mother's Day, uh, Mother's Day cards, all of which she passed out. Soon after, she, passed, uh, she realized that Father's Day was approaching, and thinking ahead, she again called the card manufacturer who responded quickly with, crates of, of Father's Day cards. Years later, the nun, the nun said she still had every one of those cards. Not one prisoner requested a card for his father. So clearly, there, the, uh, men in prison lack fathers. We are growing up in a generation where the father is almost considered to be um, disposable. Where the fathers you know, have no more use you know, in, in, in America's modern family. That is kind of nice. It, it's nice that, you know, you know uh, when, when a man and a woman get married and have kids and they stay together, but for the most part, America looks at it as being like, you know what, it doesn't really matter. Or like I say, they're disposable, so, 
You, might, you may want this guy to be, you know, ladies, you may want this one guy to be a father of your child, but then all of a sudden you get into a fight with them, so then you want this other person to be the father of your children, or you want this other person to be a father of your children. And this other, that's the reason why all of a sudden, it's kind of funny, you know, kind of funny, but really, really, really sad and ironic is that you have a whole bunch of people, and I, I, I kind of made this comment, you know, this morning, but the fact that there's actually trending on social media, baby daddy, that you actually have to label your post of your kids and say, you know what, this, you know, sorry, the post of, of, of your husband, the father of your children, and say that this is the baby's daddy. Why? Because there's so many out there that, you know what, the mom has so many partners and has to like label them out and say, well, this one and this one and this one and this one. Whatever happened to the sanctity of marriage? Whatever happened to say, you know what, you know, uh, until death do us part, for better or for worse, right? That's why I look up to, you know, the, to the fathers you know, uh, that, that, that come here. We have, one, you know, we have ones that, have, you know, that, that don't even, that the kids are not even biologically theirs. But yet they saw a need you know, uh, for kids to have a father. And they said, I'm going to be that father figure. That's what's so impressive is because, you know what, the ones that, you know, the ones consider and say, you know what, I don't have kids. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to be around them. I, you know, I just stay away from them. But we have ones that say, you know what, that kid needs a father. I'm going to be that father figure to that kid. That's awesome, isn't it? Amazing. So perhaps, you know, that as you've, you know, listened to the sermon this morning, I know it's been a little jumbled, a little bit, you know, chaotic, but maybe you realized that there's room for improvement in your life as a parent. Whether you're a mom or your dad. And maybe you've lost children. And you, and you, uh, and they haven't, you know, lived for the Lord as they should have. Pray for them today. If they're still breathing, there's still time. Pray for them. Pray for their salvation. Talk to them about the Lord. I know that they can come up with 101 reasons why and whatnot, and they'll try and throw all kinds of stuff in your face saying, you weren't the best parent growing up. Well, you know what? Show them. Show them that you've changed. Show them that you're not the same person that you were growing up. Show them that you believe this book. And then maybe for you, you maybe you've never, you know, you've never been saved. You're like, I'm not saved. Well, you know, I'm, I'm here to tell you that you can never be the kind of parent that you should be until, until you first come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You can never be the parent that you ought to be unless you're saved. You can't teach your child to do things. You can't teach your child to grow up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord if you're not saved yourself, right? In a moment, I am going to open the altar. There's not going to be any music or anything like that. But maybe you say, you know what, I want to pray for my lost kids, for my lost grandkids, my lost nieces and nephews. Or you say, you know what, I'm not saved. I want to, I want to receive the Lord. I, I want to believe upon him. I, I, I want to get saved today. You have that opportunity. But whatever you need, I want you to know that the Heavenly Father is there to help you and to make whatever is wrong right again. So this morning, for the next few moments, and Matt, if you could turn off the uh, camera. For the next few moments,